Zach's Screen of the Week, an overview of a timely stock screening strategy aimed at helping you produce more profitable investing results. We're going to talk about PEG ratio versus the PE ratio and see what kind of a screen our top stock screener, Kevin Matris, can come up with for this topic. So this, this is interesting. It's been a while since you and I have talked about it. Right. It's kind of like the... Um, Smackdown evaluations, maybe? <laughs> uh, maybe not a total smackdown, oh, but, okay. uh, but it is a comparison, and both of these valuation metrics are very important. I would probably say that these are two of the most popular valuation metrics, so I figured I would just do a side-by-side -side comparison. Sounds good. So let's start with some basics. I have some definitions. So first off, P-E ratio. That is simply price divided by earnings. And essentially, this tells you how much an investor is willing to pay for each unit of earnings. If a stock is trading at a P.E. ratio of 30, it's said to be trading at 30 times its annual earnings. Okay. In general, a lower P.E. ratio is considered to be better and a common threshold that a value investor will typically use is a P.E. ratio of 20. Also, too, just for the record, at the time of this recording, the S&P's P.E. ratio using F1 estimates was at 1533. Okay. okay. Uh, now let's look at the PEG. PEG ratio is simply the P.E. ratio divided by the growth rate. All right. Conventional wisdom says a value of one or less is considered good, which means it's at par or undervalued to its growth rate. While a value of greater than one in general is not as good, meaning it's overvalued to its growth rate. A lot of people believe that the PEG ratio tells a more complete story than the PE ratio because you're looking at another item, you're comparing it to its growth rate. And for that, I will agree. By the way, the PEG ratio for the S&P is right now coming in at 1.93. So what you're saying is the PEG ratio then goes beyond the PE ratio? Goes beyond the PE because you're able to kind of put it in a position in relationship to its growth rate, and a lot of people find that informative. Okay. But here's some examples on how you would use it in practicality. All right. Okay. So, for example, a company with a PE ratio of 25 and a growth rate of 20% would have a PEG ratio of 1.25. So you take your 25 PE divided by your 20% growth rate, that's how you get your 1.25. Mm -hmm. A company with a PE ratio of 40 and a growth rate of 50% would have a PEG ratio of 0 0.8. So again, you take your 40 PE divided by your 50% growth rate, that's how you get your 0 0.80. Got Traditionally, an investor would look at the stock with the lower P.E. ratio and determine that to be the better value. However, when you're using the PEG ratio, I think you're, uh, you're going to come up with a different conclusion. So, for example, if you see that last block of text, the stock with the P.E. ratio of 40 is really the better value because the PEG ratio is lower which shows that it's trading at a discount to its growth rate. In other words, the PEG ratio, the lower the PEG ratio generally is considered to be the better thing because the investor would be paying less for each unit of earnings growth. So while it's true, in this example, you have one with a lower PE and one with a higher PE, when you compare it to the growth rate, the one with the higher P actually is the better value because the peg is lower, which means it's trading at a greater discount to its growth rate. And that, of course, is an important metric when you're buying a stock. Which one do you like better? You know, I like them both. Um, but, you know, the, the peg ratio, <clears throat> the peg ratio I like a lot because, again, you know, when you look at low P.E., sometimes you have a P.E. ratio that is low because there's no real growth to speak of. So you definitely want to find companies that have a good growth rate, and then you just want to see, is this company trading at a premium to its growth, or is it trading at a discount? Now, 
the P or the peg ratio for the S and P, you know, we just got done saying it's at 1.93. Um, and usually people will look at a peg ratio of one or less. You can actually go up to 1.93 and still have a, a better peg ratio in comparison to the S&P. But I like both of them, but I would probably say I lean a little bit more to the peg because I like the way it positions this valuation metric in relation to the growth rate. Um, plus two, if you think about it, the, uh, the P-E ratio is still good. You couldn't even create a PEG ratio without the P-E ratio. Mm -hmm. They both have their place, but you don't want to make a decision just based on one valuation metric. That's why I think the PEG is a little bit more, um, you know, inclusive, if you will. All right. Having said all that, yes. <laughs> set it up for us. So here's a cool screen. Uh, so this screen uses both of those, and I use it in, uh, in some interesting ways, in classic ways too. First off, the screen starts off with the Zach's rank of a number one, so you're already shooting fish in a barrel. These are companies that are the top rated stocks by Zach's, so only the strong buys are going to get through. Then I want the projected one year growth rate to be greater than the S&P. As I had said earlier, sometimes you get these companies with low PE ratios because they just have crummy growth rates. This is going to ensure that you're looking at companies with outsized growth rates in comparison to the market. And if you see here, uh, the average growth rate using the F1 estimate for the S&P is currently at 7.94%. So any company with a growth rate above that number is going to be able to qualify, okay? Uh, next, we have the P-E ratio. I want the P-E ratio to be less than or equals to 20. That is the classical way that people will look at P-E, that 20 threshold. And I want the P-E ratio to be less than the median for its industry. Since some industries have different types of, you know, valuations that are considered to be standard, mm -hmm. a typical value guy, he's going to want to see it hit on some of those absolute numbers, but then you're also going to want to make sure that you're buying the stock that, uh, that has the lowest valuations or at least better valuations than most of its peers. So that's why we put that one in there as well. Okay. I think that's a good way to use it. Mm -hmm. And we're doing the same thing with the peg ratio. Peg ratio less than or equals to one, classical valuation marker, and we want the peg ratio to be less than or equals to the industry median. So you're, you're looking at a valuation stock on, like I said, an absolute basis and on relative terms in relationship to its group of peers. And usually I like to apply all of my stuff to companies that, uh, that are trading over $5 and they have 100,000 shares traded on a daily basis or more. All right. So, what came through this particular screen? There were, I believe, like maybe about 40, 45 companies that came through. As usual, there was a wide range of stocks representing a wide range of industries. These were some pretty cool picks, so let's look at a couple of them. You'll also see that I put the P-E ratio and the PEG ratio next to it. Mm -hmm. So again, anybody looking for stocks that have good growth rates but also can qualify as a, as a classic value stock, this would be it. So I've got Canadian Solar. <clears throat> you can see the PE is 1104 and the PEG ratio using F1. Some people will look at the PEG ratio using the projected three to five year growth rate, but a lot of companies won't give you a three to five year growth rate, rendering that PEG ratio obsolete, right? You get a bunch of NAs. I like using the F1. If you're using F1 on your PE, why not use it on your PEG? So you can see it's got a tiny peg. And by the way, that's because Canadian Solar has a 300% growth rate. But then you got Methanex, Royal Caribbean, Sabra Health, uh, and Trinity Industries. All of these look fantastic on both of those valuation metrics. And once again, because we said we want these stocks to have growth rates better than the market, not only are they giving you outsized growth rates in comparison to the broader market, but you're also looking at valuation metrics that are less than, uh, than the broader market, as well as less than the median for their industry, which in my belief means they have the greatest amount of upside potential. I'm still trying to get this image of you shooting fish in a barrel out of my <laughs> mind for some reason. It's a great sport. It's stuck you there. can't lose. Hey, do you own any of these? Uh, yeah, I do have Sabra and Trinity. Okay. 
Well, we thank you for stopping by and sharing. And if you want to see a text version of this week's screen, stop on by Zach's.com's homepage. Link to it right off the homepage if you're not there already watching this video. And if you want to know more about the Research Wizard, that happens to be the tool that Kevin uses to achieve all of these screens, then Zach's.com slash Research Wizard is the place to take a peek at. With Kevin Matris and the Screen of the Week, I'm Terry Ruffalo.